If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Very early on in my ministry, I preached on that sermon, uh, a sermon on that text, and there was an angry and negative man waiting at the door of the church building for me to tell me that I was a pulpit bully and that there was no value in anything that I had said to any of God's people. Now I wonder what he might have said to our brother Tim if uh, he'd heard that sermon there this morning. I think almost since then I have felt as a Christian and as a pastor that I have had to battle against the heart-melting despondency of so many of God's people against churches whose highest aim seems to be to die more slowly, ministers' conference with old men mourning over the breakfast and dinner tables about the fact that the glory has departed from the land, suggestions made for ministry and opportunities for the preaching of the gospel, which everybody already knows aren't going to work, because even if they tried them before, they all fell to the ground. I'm therefore very grateful for what our brothers already said to us and uh, what I want to do really you might consider nothing more than an extended application of what you have already heard. For that I'd like you to turn please to Romans and chapter 1. Romans and chapter 1. Paul, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if, by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's see God's face briefly. Lord God, we cannot rely on the favour that we enjoyed last night. We cannot depend upon the blessing that you've given to others already. We ask, O God, that in this session you would show us your glorious face once more, 
that you would impress truth upon our souls, that you would lift and stir and encourage our hearts to the praise of the glory of your grace. Help us to see Christ and to behold your glory shining in his face. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul makes his intention clear. I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Verse 15. As much as is in me, with everything I am and with all that I have, I am primed, I am poised, I am determined, I am eager to speak the good news in Rome. Paul is saying that he wants to go to the political centre of the ancient world. He wants to go to the economic centre of the ancient world, to the place where Roman culture uh, has its peak and from which it all flows, from one of the intellectual centres of the world as he knew it, from one of the moral, or you might even say amoral, centres of the ancient world. In other words, Paul wants to go where the giants are. And Paul wants to go there and he wants to preach the gospel. And you can imagine people telling him, or at least talking about him, especially if they're British, they won't talk to you, they'll talk about you. So they're saying, well, it's all right for Paul, but it's a bit pointless, isn't it? What a waste of that man's time and energy. Why would you begin to preach the gospel at Rome? You might have asked the Lord Jesus the same thing, might you not? When he told his disciples, preach the gospel beginning at Jerusalem. Go to the men and women who crucified me. Go to those who bade for my blood. Go to the centre of Jewish religious practice and conviction and tell them that the man who hung upon the cross at their bidding and willing is the saviour of sinners like them. And that if they trust in him, they also will be redeemed. Paul's intention then, with everything that is in him, is to preach the good news to those who are at Rome also. Now, on what basis is the Apostle going to proceed? Why can he declare such a thing? Where does the confidence for that intention come from? Well, the declaration that he then begins to make in verses 16 and 17 answers the question. Why are you ready to preach the good news to those who are in Rome, Paul? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul knows that in the world in which he lives, as much as in ours today, this good news is considered contemptible. People look down their noses at it. The truth of God as it is in Christ is despised. It is, to use the language that he writes to the Corinthians, that it's foolishness and it's weakness in the eyes of men. This crucified Nazarene, this Jew who hung upon a tree outside Jerusalem. This is salvation. This is God at work in the world. Why is it so despised? It's because it humbles proud men. And it exposes those who think themselves wise in themselves and righteous in their own eyes. But that which is despised, that which is contemptible, that which is sneered at in the world, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now he might have said positively, I glory in the gospel. And, and that's certainly implied. That's what he's saying. I believe the gospel for myself. I glory in that gospel. And I am ready therefore to declare that gospel. This is the Christ crucified in whom I boast. I am dead to the world because of this Christ. And the world is dead to me because of this Christ and his cross. And therefore I will go and preach the gospel. But it's interesting that rather than simply saying, I'm glorying in the gospel, he turns it into a, a positive negative, if you like. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I think he's answering some of the threats and some of the pressures 
that the Roman Christians and others, even us, might have felt. See, Paul understands that there is an offence in the cross of Jesus Christ. He's not suggesting that we become as offensive as possible when we preach the gospel. But what he understands is that a so-called gospel which has become inoffensive has by very definition become ineffective. That there's no cutting edge left in it unless it strikes at so-called human wisdom and cuts down so-called human strength. And so Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I am not ashamed of it. I am ready to make it known fully and freely at the very heart of, of the, uh, even in, in, in Roman terms, the, the cult of the emperor. The man who's going to proclaim himself Lord rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. The Caesar who in due course is going to make it a test of your attachment to him. Who is Lord? Caesar or Christ? Paul says, that's where I'm going. And that's where I'm going to tell them about Jesus Christ. Well, why is that then, Paul? Why are you not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. This good news is God's own power. It is a mighty instrument of His divine strength. This good news, this declaration concerning Jesus Christ, this is the God of heaven at work in the world to save the people upon whom He has set His love. So that everyone who believes, not just the Gentiles elsewhere, not just the Jews in Jerusalem or scattered through the world, but even you yourselves in Rome. This is the way that sinners can be saved. It's the only way that sinners can be saved. And everyone who believes, regardless of their background, their circumstances, wherever God finds them, if the Gospel comes to them with the power of the Holy Spirit, then they will be converted. And the whole of chapter 2 of the letter to the Romans is really a development of that. Are you a Jew? Then you're under the curse of God for your sins against Him regardless of the light that has come to you in the Old Testament. And are you a Gentile? Having the work of the law written in your heart? Then you too know the difference between right and wrong. And the Word of God comes and the law of God exposes us all so that there is none righteous before God. No, there is not one. But I, says Paul, I have the answer. I have the good news of Jesus Christ for you. Everything else will fail you. Everything else will, will collapse underneath you. Everything else will be a, a staff that breaks when you put your weight upon it. But there's no shame there's no despair, there's no disappointment in the gospel of Jesus Christ for Paul as a man or for Paul as a minister. He's able to say, I know whom I have believed, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. A personal testimony and now a pastoral testimony and I willing able, eager and ready to preach that good news in any and every place to any and every person because I know that this good news is God's power to salvation for everyone who believes. And you might say, well again Paul, what, what grounds have you got for believing that? What's the foundation upon which you can make that assertion? And Paul basically says, the substance of the gospel I preach can bear the weight of my confidence. What the gospel is can hold up my intention, my declaration, my assertion. I'm ready to preach the gospel, even in Rome. I'm not ashamed of that gospel. It's the power of God to salvation. What is it, Paul, that gives you this confidence? In this gospel, the righteousness of God in Christ is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel bears the weight of our hope, brothers and sisters. The gospel bears the weight of the confidence that we as God's people, ourselves, privately, and then publicly, can, can rest upon it. It is heavenly truth in heavenly power. 
It is God's revelation of divine righteousness in the Christ who died for sinners and received by faith alone. God has made known in this Gospel that in the person of His Son there is a salvation that is complete, entire, certain, sure, perfect, wonderful, sweet, everything that a sinner might need. And whoever trusts in this Jesus, whoever receives what God Himself has provided for us, will be reconciled to God. There will now be peace between God in His holiness and man repenting and believing. This Gospel has been revealed. God has spoken it. It's no human invention. Certainly not the men who are speaking at this conference. We didn't put our heads together beforehand and say, can we come up with something that's really going to be a bit of a pep talk for these folks? If it were, we wouldn't have dreamed this up, would we? There's a man 2,000 years ago who died on a cross outside Jerusalem. And that doesn't sound to the ears of the unbelieving any more appealing today than it did 2,000 years ago. This is God's Gospel. He's made it known. This is divine wisdom. This is divine strength. Paul will insist to the Galatians, I didn't make this up and I didn't get it from other people. God has made known this truth from heaven so that sinners like us believing might be redeemed. And it's a divine righteousness. It's God's own righteousness. Nothing else pleases God. Our righteousnesses, says Isaiah, are like filthy rags. They're despicable, they're vile, they're ugly, they're stinking in the eyes of a holy God. But now in Christ, here is God's own righteousness provided. Here are the divine perfections wrapped around His people. It's not a human righteousness. It's not a righteousness that comes from trying hard and doing better. That's not good news. If I say to you this morning, just try a bit harder, do a bit better, and maybe, just maybe, you'll get high enough that God might not quite damn you as bad as everybody else. But if I tell you that in Christ Jesus, God has provided a spotless, pure, perfect righteousness that pleases Him, a God-satisfying, truly justifying righteousness, That when God looks upon the man, woman, boy or girl who is resting on this Christ and his finished work, he sees us through the lens of his Son. And on the basis of Christ's righteousness received by faith, he declares us to be righteous in his sight. Our sin put away, peace with God established and the way to heaven opened up. Accepted in the Beloved. The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. This is the only way to receive and enjoy this righteousness. No other trust can intrude. You cannot add to the righteousness of Christ. You need not add to the righteousness of Christ. It is blasphemy to try to add to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no mixing and matching. There's no throwing in a little bit of self to sit alongside Jesus on the throne. In salvation, glory belongs to the God who saves. And those who are saved simply ascribe or testify that it is God and His Lamb who are glorious. It is by faith that you enter this life. It is by faith that you endure in this life. And it is by faith that you enjoy this life. Looking away from self, up and out to God in His Son, Jesus Christ, with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit, to behold the perfections, the glories, the beauties, the excellencies of the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came into the world, suffered and died, having lived a life of perfect obedience to his Father, rising again on the third day, ascending up into heaven, sitting now at the right hand of the majesty on high, and coming again to judge the world at the last day, and to bring all his people to himself. It's by faith in him, who he is and all that he has done, that we enjoy the favour, the mercy, the acceptance of God. And Paul's going to go to Rome and tell them that. He's going to tell the Christians in Rome that. 
In fact, maybe because he's not sure he's going to get there, he does a pretty good job in Romans of setting them up for it. I think largely Romans is, this is what I'm going to tell you when I get there. I might have to put a bit more flesh on the bones. Imagine that. Romans might be the bones. The flesh is still to come. Paul says, I want you to know this. I want you to understand this. But when you come to the end of the Acts of the risen Jesus, you'll find Paul at Rome and he's preaching this gospel to everyone. To the Jew first, also to the Greek, and it is proving the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And I will go and tell them that God himself has turned away that wrath in the person of his Son. I will go to the giants and I will tell them the truth. Come to Christ is Paul's gospel. And you will be cleansed from your sin. You will be clothed in God's own righteousness. You shall enjoy life. Habakkuk knew that. Where's Habakkuk? Habakkuk's the man who first said that the just shall live by his faith. That prophet understood that the kind of life and peace that is enjoyed by the one who is looking to God, that life comes by faith. That that man receives and proceeds and rejoices in life because he's resting on the God of salvation. Abraham knew that. Paul tells us that in chapter 4. David knew that. Paul tells us that in chapter 4. This is not a new thing. It has fresh depth. It has new light, if you will. We see it more clearly than our forefathers did. But they were justified by believing on the Jesus who was to come, and we are justified by trusting in the Jesus who has come. He is at the centre of our gospel because in him the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it was written, the just shall live by his faith. This has been and remains the abiding message of salvation from sin, from death, from hell from the righteous indignation of a holy God. God has provided in his beloved Son his own righteousness. Receive it by faith, enter in, enjoy what God has provided. This, my friends, is the good news. He is the good news. And hanging upon him, you are sustained in life and in death. At this moment, through life, the gates of the grave, into eternity, at the day of judgment, and in the glory which lies ahead. Your boast, your song, will never be anything more or less than the Lamb of God who was crucified for sinners. So Paul preaches it everywhere. Preaches it in Galatia. He goes to Corinth, the sinkhole of the ancient world, and preaches it there. He preaches it in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Athens. Sometimes people tell you, oh, he went to Athens, he tried something different in Athens. No, he didn't. Why did they ask Paul what he was talking about? Because he went and stood in the middle of Athens, and first of all, he told them about Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And that's why he had the further opportunity to explain on Mars Hill. And what happens by the end of that sermon? Who's he preaching again? The Jesus whom God has raised from the dead in declaration of the coming judgment and calling upon the Athenians to believe in this Jesus that they may be saved. Everywhere he goes, even now in Rome itself, Paul is primed to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. The divine deeds of grace and mercy that we must know and upon which we must rest if we are to be saved. It's truth with power. Words with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with much assurance. Paul was not ashamed. And I think then that perhaps one of the reasons that rather than simply saying, I glory in the gospel, which he can do and will do in other places, Paul says he is not ashamed of the gospel, is because he knows that in Rome, 
and in Alfreton and in any other number of places which are represented here, that being ashamed of the gospel is all too easy. Now, if we're Christians, evangelical Christians, reformed evangelical Christians, even evangelical reformed Baptists, we've become very good at hiding this. We're masters of the camouflage that covers over our shame with regard to the gospel. We dress up our fear and our lack of confidence in all kinds of spiritual sounding language. So why are we ashamed of this mighty gospel? Why are we ashamed of the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes? Why this unchanged and unchanging truth is something that we, we, we've learned to sort of keep to one side? Where do we see that in our experience? The first way I think that we show ourselves to be ashamed of the gospel is simply by a failure to put faith in Jesus Christ for ourselves. And some of you may be here this morning and you are ashamed of the gospel. You are ashamed of Jesus. You may have been brought up in a Christian home. Or you may have just walked in through the back door and heard this for the first time. But if you are not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself now, what are you actually saying? I don't really want him or I don't really need him. You're saying in effect that I think I'm okay with God or I think there's something that I can do or will do, perhaps eventually, in order that I might stand accepted before the Almighty. To neglect Jesus Christ and his righteousness is to despise the gospel of God. To hope that perhaps somehow, maybe you can get close enough that Jesus Christ can close the gap between you and God, rather than even this very moment to acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a saviour and that God himself has provided all that you might ever require in the person of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Please do not leave this building today still at a distance from Jesus Christ, still ashamed of the gospel, still perhaps concerned about the price that you'll have to pay, the cost of following Jesus Christ. My friend, Life and death is at stake. Heaven and hell is at stake. The favour of God hangs upon your relationship to Jesus Christ. Come to Him and do not be ashamed of Him. Trust Him. Declare that He is yours and that you are His. Another way beyond this perhaps that we show ourselves ashamed of the gospel is by a shallow grasp of the truth as it is in Jesus. Many Christians today, Brother Ryan was talking about yeah, not, not being great readers. That's a fantastic excuse, isn't it? You know, it's not quite the spiritual language, but uh, I, I'm not really a reader. Or, or perhaps we say, oh, well, uh, you're, you're one of those guys that's all about doctrine. Yeah, I'm, I'm a heart Christian, me. That's what I'm interested in. Well, you better shut Romans before you get too far again into chapter 1. Because Romans is doctrine. It's truth. The whole Bible is full of truth. It teaches us about the God of our salvation. If you are a, a football fan and you've got a particular team, somebody gave you an opportunity to walk through the trophy room, wouldn't you linger for a little while? Perhaps you'd look at those, those cool black and white images that hang behind, you know, the iconic goal that won this particular trophy. You read again the histories of how these things were accomplished. It was the 88th minute, it was the 89th, it was the 90th minute. Time was added on and this is the result. Perhaps you go to the National Gallery if you're into art. Imagine someone walking through that, yeah, picture, 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 very nice cow, horse, person. <laughs> yeah, I've seen people do that. Have you ever stopped and looked at some of those pictures? I can get lost in some of those. I, I can stare at them for an hour. You see the layers and the depths and the beauties. You read a book of poetry, just flick your way through it. And you might say, that's not my cup of tea. If you're a Christian, the gospel is your cup of tea. If you're a Christian, there are depths. 
There are heights. There are beauties. There are wonders in the good news of the eternal Son of God who became man. Have you plumbed the depths of that yet? Can you put a tick in that box? Can you tell me you can move on from there? That you're, you're content with these things? Oh, don't dazzle me with science. Just, you know, just get on. Tell me stories. Give me the how-tos. My friends, have you plumbed the depths of God's good news? Have you filled your lungs with the oxygen of grace and dived as deep as you can and so expanded and extended your capacity so that day by day, week by week, month by month, you don't get used to the gospel. You get more astounded by the gospel. It humbles you. It shatters you. It exposes you. Sometimes it scours you. And like Isaiah in the temple, you feel more and more your sin as the light of God in the gospel becomes more and more clear to you. How easily satisfied are you with knowing what you know? Or how eager are you to discover more and more? You ask any healthy saint in their older years, and I think they'll tell you, they're still seeking to know Jesus Christ better than they did the day before. They still read the Bible. Open another page. Yeah, I've never seen that before. So we, you, you must have read it a hundred times. Yeah, but I never saw it. Never felt it. Never impressed upon my soul. Assured trust. How do you want to increase your faith? You need to know more about Jesus Christ. What about your hope, your confidence in what lies ahead? Then you need to know more about Christ in the Gospel. What about your love for God? Father, Son and Spirit. And spilling over from your love for Him, your love for all the people. You need to know the good news as it is in Jesus Christ. Christian, you are by definition a student and a scholar. You may not have a great brain to devote to this, but you give every grey cell you've got. Every throb of your heart to know more about the Lord Jesus and about this righteousness of God that's been revealed from faith to faith. Otherwise you're saying in effect, I'm ashamed of the gospel, not that bothered, doesn't attract me, doesn't hold my attention. Another way we prove ourselves in measure ashamed of the gospel is by entertaining doubts about it personally. Now, you may not have that problem, but there are whole denominations, I'm talking hundreds if not thousands of people, who if you ask almost all of them, are you a Christian? They say, oh, I hope so. Yeah. And they don't mean, I have confidence. What they mean is maybe, but I can't be sure. Very often, not always, but very often when you ask them, why can't you be sure? They will say, well, me. Well, I. My experience, my circumstances. They're trained in measure. Every time they're tempted to look to Jesus Christ, to look back at themselves, to think, well, yeah, but maybe. You know, look how wretched I am. Look how miserable I am. My friends, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you're saved. Amen. If you're resting on the rock, then you're secure. If you have taken God at His word, do you really think He's going to let you down? The God of salvation, the God of my salvation, use that language. This is my God. This is my Savior. This man can say He loved me and gave Himself for me. Your doubts about the Gospel have no merit. Because God is at work to save sinners. If God says, take my hand and I'll hang on to you, you can take His hand and you can be confident that you are saved. Some of you know the Peanuts cartoons? Charlie Brown? There's, there's one of those where, I think there's, there's a little kid called Linus, I think, and Linus is in a big swimming pool. Charlie Brown walks past and he starts teaching Linus how to swim and he says, you know, so you lean over like this and you move your arms like this and then the little girl in the strip, I think her name is Lucy, she comes along, she says, Charlie Brown, why don't you get in and show him how to do it? Not me, says Charlie Brown, I'm terrified of water. 
Now, how does it commend the gospel of Jesus Christ? If someone is saying, why don't you jump in, the water's fine. You say, what about you? Not me, I'm terrified of water. Are you a Christian? Well, I'm not sure. Do you believe in this Jesus? Oh, I hope so. My friends, if we're ashamed of the gospel, if we don't think that we can rest our weight personally upon this Jesus for ourselves, how will we ever tell people with, with much assurance that this is the saviour from sins? Do you show yourselves? Now, I understand that the, the world, the flesh, the devil, there are assaults and accusations, there are experiences, there are temptations, there are persecutions. I'm not pretending that that's not so. But are we persuaded that the gospel saves sinners like me? That the gospel is for a sinner like me to trust this Jesus and trusting him Things must be well with my soul or God has ungodded himself. God has ceased to be God if a sinner trusting in Jesus is lost. And the confidence then is not how strong my grip is, but the strength of the Christ in whom I'm trusting. It is God in his gospel, the power of God to salvation upon which we rest. We look not then to ourselves, in our imagined strength or our very real weakness, but to the God who's made himself known in Jesus Christ. We show ourselves again ashamed of the gospel when we don't live in accordance with this truth. When we live in gloom, when we live on the, on the borders, when we forget that we are now citizens of heaven. And that should be evident in the things that we enjoy, in the thoughts that we have, in the feelings that we, we have in our souls, in the, the songs that we sing. Does anybody know us as hymn singers? Your children know you as a, a dad or a mum who sings the praises of God, that that comes out quite naturally. That there's a, a delight in God. That you read your Bible not by mere rote, but because this is the very bread of life to your soul. That you go to church, not because it's a habit and you have to go there, but because wild horses wouldn't keep you back from entering into the presence of the living God with his lively people to hear the word of God preached to our souls. We are citizens of glory. Heaven is already in us and we are on our way to heaven. There's a newness of life and brothers and sisters, if we are not pursuing holiness in the fear of the Lord, then we're showing ourselves ashamed of the gospel. This transforms us. This changes us. Nothing is the same after we've come to Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. From the very core of my being, radiating outward in thought, word and deed, I am now his. And nothing can be as it was before. And when I find something that goes in that direction, something that drifts on the current of the old man, that's when I cry out for the grace and the mercy that is in this God, for the life that is in this Christ, to show itself once again. We're ashamed of the gospel when we're unwilling to defend it. Are you a coward? I am, by nature. Yeah, we, we, can, we can hear about those giants. It's, it's very easy, isn't it, in here to say, I'm going to go out and slay those bad boys. <laughs> and then you're dealing with the equivalent of someone who says to you, now you look me in the belly button and say that. You know those moments in the films? Just giving Tim a bit of a breathe here on this Indiana Jones thing as well. You know, you know, there's always that, that bad guy. There's often the bad guy. You know, the hero's taken out a lot of the minions, hasn't he? And then someone walks into the room and he does this. Uh, we're okay with sometimes the little giants and oh, this is a really big giant this is an unusually gigantic giant perhaps the person at work is so full of coarse joking and is quite ready to make you the butt of their jokes that clever person at school or at university 
who you think is going to be able to run rings around you when it comes to explaining and defending the good news in Jesus Christ. The husband who's going to sneer at you when you go home. The children who are going to laugh at you because you've become part of the God squad. The wife who's going to tell you that you're no man because you're, you become religious. Now you're a namby-pamby sissy. The friends who are going to say, you're not the man we used to know. You're not the woman we used to know. The people who seem to take delight in blaspheming when you're around. The people who try and maybe provoke you. The neighbour that you once tried to invite to church who gave you the rough side of their tongue. And you think, oh, I'm not sure I ever want to try that again. This is your saviour. I shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. I think I need to be ashamed of myself. That I profess to trust in this man to save me from my sins. And yet when his name is blasphemed, when his person is trampled upon, when his glories are despised, when his good news is dismissed, I may not laugh along, but I'm quite happy to melt into the shadows. I'll just back off. I mean, people know I, I do church. But do they know the Jesus that I trust? And again, we become experts in being just religious enough to salve our consciences and yet not Christian enough to pay the price for following Jesus Christ. We become ashamed of the gospel. It's derided, it's undermined, it's even perverted. And we sit perhaps in churches where no true gospel is preached and we say, that'll do. We belong to denominations where the very foundations of the truth are being ripped apart and shredded. When there's a divorce between what we say we believe and how we actually behave. And we say, well, maybe it'll get better. We draw another line. Say, if they cross that one, boy, I'm going to stand up then. And then a giant steps over and says, well, I'm going to draw a line here again. You better not tread over this one. People spend their entire lives drawing new lines. And threatening all kinds of, you, <laughs> you wait till they cross this one. All right, I will. You hear pompous men. It's time to speak truth to power. You heard that phrase? Brother, you won't even talk to your neighbour. What makes you think you're going to talk truth to power? You, know, you, you won't run with the, horse, with the footmen. What do you think you're going to do when the horsemen come onto the field? You haven't even come anywhere near the giants yet. You ran away when you saw the children playing. We don't speak. We're content to have a, a little religious reputation. We're the people who go to church. Maybe we, you, know, you see us dressed up on Sunday morning, but don't worry. We won't tell you. you know, we, we've accepted this kind of contract, social contract, that religion is very much a private matter. I believe what I believe, that's my opinion. You believe what you believe, that's your opinion. And we'll just kind of let this uneasy peace settle between us. And if an awkward topic of conversation comes up about, say, sexual morality, about uh, righteous living, about coarse joking, about what you watched on the internet, about the songs that you sing, the places you go, we'll, we've learned to skirt around it. And I'm not going to tell you you're a sinner and I'm not going to tell you there's a saviour. What else do we do? We modify. We soften. We divert. You might have sung of the old rugged cross, but you're a little bit uncomfortable with how many splinters it leaves in carnal flesh. So you plane it down and you sand it off. You've got a gospel that you've managed to make so inoffensive that it's no longer at all effective. You've made it palatable. Or perhaps even, brothers and sisters, we've diverted our energies. We've become a people of something other than the book, something other than the cross. You, you can't campaign somebody into the kingdom of God. 
You can't insulate your family into the kingdom of God. You cannot educate your children into the kingdom of God. You cannot campaign a nation into the kingdom of God. You cannot march people into the kingdom of God. You cannot have your t-shirts and your posters. I'm not saying these things are at all utterly worthless in themselves. But my friends, if we want to see society changed, it's by the preaching of the gospel. Paul did not say, I'm going to go to Rome and I've got a fantastic leaflet campaign all lined up. I've got a team of people who are ready and we're going to start interacting with the movers and shakers among the senators in Rome. We're going to see if we can start the top down. Paul sat in a prison and told people about Jesus Christ. When do the drunkards dry up? When do the perverted people straighten up? When are the despisers humbled? When do people in positions of prominence and power begin to act in righteousness? It's when they bow the knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, trusting in Jesus Christ. My friends, have we become... Well, let me put it this way. Sometimes those giants look a bit more manageable, don't they? We can give ourselves the impression that we're accomplishing something, that we're getting somewhere, that we, we've done something. After all, look at our website. Woo! How many sinners have turned from their sins to trust in Jesus Christ? Perhaps even in pulpits or on the street. We've learned to, to hedge our bets a little bit. The pressure that is on a pastor when he looks out at people and he sees angry faces. To say, I'm not sure I can say that today. But you're preparing your sermon. You think, oh, I think Mrs. Brown's going to be there today. I might just need to alter that a wee bit. Or you begin even making excuses for people. Here is a Christian duty. Here is a Christian privilege. Here is the responsibility and the dignity of the sons of God. Unless you're in this category, this category, this category, this category, or this category. Too often, we as Christians begin to provide our own howevers and neverthelesses. We, we already do that so that no one needs to feel too bad about themselves. We preach an inoffensive gospel and it proves an ineffective gospel. Or do we declare the whole counsel of God? Do we speak it not angrily, aggressively? I sometimes see street preachers who seem to imagine that if they they must be doing something for Jesus. Are we telling people the truth that saves? That will annoy them enough without you being annoying. You preach Christ and him crucified. You tell sinners like you and me that outside of the finished work of Jesus Christ, there is no hope of heaven. Somebody walks past you in the open air. Would you like this tract? Oh, I'm all right. Okay, what does that mean? Or sometimes they say, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. That's a great way of fobbing you off, isn't it? I, I'm a Christian. You ask them next. What wonderful news to hear. Tell me, when did you repent of the sins that would have taken you to hell and put your trust in Jesus Christ, the God-man, as the only saviour of sinners and the grounds upon which you stand accepted with the holy God, your creator and your redeemer? And you see the veneer fall away. You see the mark drop off. That anger, the antagonism that lies just beneath the surface and we become experts at just brushing the skin rather than bringing the gospel blade to bear. And then we're slow to declare it. 
When was the last time you actually told your saviour? Not that you told someone that you go to church. Not that you told someone that you read your Bible. Not that you, you, you threw up those little flags that in an evangelical community will, will tell people that you're one of the good guys. But you actually sat down and explained to someone who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ has done, and how you can have peace with God. What are your plans to do so? What are your schemes as congregations to take the good news into a dying world and tell people who will be in hell without Jesus that there is a saviour for their souls and their bodies in him? How quickly and readily do we speak of Jesus Christ? You know, go speak truth to power. Friend, you don't talk to your neighbour. Go speak truth to your neighbour. Brothers and sisters, we don't always tell the truth to one another. How many of us can get through a Lord's Day or a fellowship conference without actually talking very much about the Lord Jesus Christ? Where's the overspill of your love? Ever seen a young man in the first month of his girlfriend or the guy who's just got married? You can't shut him up. His love flows over. The, 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 the girl who's just got engaged and her friends are like, is she ever going to stop going on about this guy? You think the sun shines out of him? My friends, the bridegroom of our hearts is perfection himself. Altogether lovely, altogether glorious, and it doesn't seem to have much impact on our souls. We sing our hymns of praise as if we're going to a funeral. We sing our hymns of meditation as if we're already in the grave. We pray like there's no prospect. We talk like Jesus is already dead and never rose again. We say, why are so few being converted? Without ever really asking the question, why are so few being told about Jesus Christ? We show ourselves ashamed of the gospel when we have low expectations of it. And again, we dress it up in the right language. Tell me, do you come from an unusually dry place spiritually? That's the language you hear, isn't it? Oh, I know God's working over, but it's very dry here. Hearts are very hard here. Now, Alfreton's not a great place for the gospel. Tell me somewhere that is. Tell me a place that is primed to receive Jesus Christ outside of the prior operations of the Spirit of God. Tell me the country to which you can go, the belief system that exists, where they're virtually Christians already and you just need to tip them over the edge. We do it when we go out witnessing. You can probably run your way down the street in which you live and you can tell me the people who aren't worth talking to. I mean, there's no, there's no point. Now, they're just not interested. They won't believe. Or maybe you've got, let's try this. Somebody says, no, we tried that in the 60s. It doesn't work. Have you thought of trying it again? <laughs> Have you thought of trying God? In doing the work? Have you thought about resting upon him? Have you thought about spending seasons in prayer before you do anything, calling upon the name of the Lord? And please, please, please don't make it a prayer meeting where everybody stands up and tells us again that this is a day of small things. Amen. We know how to undermine ourselves before we've even begun anything. We've got all these little pat phrases. We confess our weakness, but we do not hang upon the strength of God. And the point isn't that we build ourselves up. We are lower and more needy than we could possibly imagine. But there is a God in heaven who saves sinners by the power of his gospel. Now, do we or do we not believe that that is the case? 
We've already decided it doesn't work and therefore we don't try. We know the people who aren't interested. We know the regions where it doesn't work. Perhaps even we hear of the gospel going forth in some other place and God's at work over there. But he's written Ichabod over our city. His glory is departed from our congregation. It doesn't work here. These are unlikely candidates. There are no likely candidates. There's no dead man who's likely to become alive again. It needs the power of God to raise a sinner from the dead. And if you're not proof of that, then where will you find it? Are you the worthy ones? Am I the man who deserves to be converted? Are we the people who climbed high enough out of the slimy pit in order for God to reach down and grab us? Or did God find us in our misery, in our filth, in our ugliness and in our vileness? My friends, if there's a pride that lies at the depth of our silence with regard to Christ and his gospel, the idea that somehow perhaps in the building are the people who are somehow worthy, but out there are the people who aren't interested and won't care. We need to remind ourselves of how God works and why God works. We pray without faith. We pray without hope. We look at ourselves and we seem to be grasshoppers in our own sight. When was the last time? Now, I'm not saying we should, but yeah, we, we don't as Christians say, well, look at us. <laughs> and we shouldn't. I mean, look at us. Really, look at us. What are we going to accomplish? Our resources? Our wisdom? Our numbers? Our hands? Our churches? Then what is the point? Now look at us. And then look at them. Oh, they are big and ugly. And they're hard and they're dry and they're angry and they're callous and they're clever and they're resistant and they're busy. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes because in God's gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith just as it is written the just shall live by his faith my friends if we can't rely on the God of the gospel to do his work by his gospel then we might as well pack up and go home right now do you believe that this is God's good news for salvation do you believe in the Christ who saves whoever calls upon his name? Do you believe that God, by his mighty and gracious spirit, draws sinners to himself? Do you believe that he opens the eyes of the blind? Do you believe that he unstops the ears of the deaf? Do you believe that he stirs dead hearts to life? Do you believe that he is a saviour for sinners like me? And like you, and like anyone who by his grace he calls. There is no one anywhere beyond the power of this gospel. I was in Zambia last week. What am I going to tell them? The gospel. I came back and spoke to 15, 20 of our parents and young people at a church camp. What have I got to offer them? The gospel. I've come to Alfreton to preach at the fellowship conference. What have I got? The gospel. Next week I'm going to preach at somebody's wedding. What will I tell the people who gather? The gospel. Now I may need to take account of those particular circumstances. I need to become all things to all men, understanding the, the patterns and the challenges. I need to look at the people who live next to me on the street, the people who look on the other side, the kind of town that I'm in, the kind of circumstances that I'm about. I need to understand the way that these beloved men and women, boys and girls are thinking, the way that they've been trained. 
And then I need to work out how to tell the gospel to them. Not to mould it and plane it and change it and adapt it so that it doesn't bother them too much, so that it fits nice and easy in their religious or social culture, whatever it may be. I need to work out how to come close to men and women made in the image of God, to sinners dead in their trespasses and sins, and to look them in the eye with love for their souls and the God who converts. Faith in the Christ who has said he's come into the world, sinners to save. Hope that this gospel, unchanged and unchanging, goes on being the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And I tell them the history and the mystery of the gospel plainly. And I trust the God of salvation to carry it home into their souls. And I can tell you for myself that I know it's one thing to speak these things from the pulpit. And another thing to walk out of the door, to drive home after the church service, to see people walking past and to tell them about Jesus. To see that neighbour who really doesn't want to know. To talk to the woman whose angry drunkenness you can hear echoing night after night. To speak to the, the Muslim people who live just across the street. To talk to the Roman Catholic family that aren't too far away. To chat with the guy on the other side of the street who dresses in women's clothes. To go and hang out with the young people in the neighbourhood where the church building is. And to tell them that there's a Christ who saves. To talk to the, the nans with the blue rinse. And when you tell them if you're the local church, they turn the air bluer than their hair. To talk to the proud and the arrogant and the despairing and the miserable. To talk to the people who are utterly wretched in every imaginable sense to the human eye. And to those for whom butter wouldn't melt in their mouth. And to tell everyone that there is a God who saves sinners through the righteousness that he has provided in his son, Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Do you believe this Jesus and his Father and ours. Do you glory in the gospel? Is it your peace, your hope, your joy, your delight? Is Christ himself ever more lovely to you? Is the embrace of the Father ever more sweet to you? Are the workings of the Spirit ever more delightful for you why would you hold this back from anybody else because I'm afraid then be persuaded afresh that the good news that Christ has committed to his church is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Do you need to be ashamed of such a gospel? Is it going to let you down in the day of judgment? When you stand before this Christ in his glory, clothed in his righteousness, are you going to find that there's a rip in the robe? Is the ark of God's salvation going to start leaking when the floods of final judgment come upon you? Or bold will you stand in that great day? For who ought to your charge shall lay? Fully absolved through Christ you are. That's your confidence. And it's the confidence that you hold out to any sinner that you meet. There is a Christ who has died and has risen and who reigns on high and who will soon return in his glory. Trust in him and you too shall be saved. This is still saving truth for me, for you, and for all who will come to God in Christ. Let us learn to think like those who are not ashamed of the gospel. 
to feel like those who glory in the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And to live and to speak, resting on God and his saving truth for ourselves and for the work that he has given us to do in this world. Amen. Amen.